So, uh, so I think we begin with sort of Hong Kong precision, uh, exactly at three o'clock, which is uh, what time it is now. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you to our Basel for organizing this lovely panel. My name is Philip Tenari, and I'm uh, the editor of a magazine in Beijing called Leap, and I'm also sort of the China representative for for our Basel for many years now. Um, and I'm extremely privileged to have with me today two guests who kind of hold the, the future of Hong Kong's museum uh, landscape <laughs> in the palm uh, of their collective hand. They're, they're, they're not only the, uh, the leaders of M+, uh, which will be the sort of flagship museum uh, in a place called the West Kowloon Cultural District, which you're now looking at a rendering of. They're also actually the only two uh, staff members of the museum. Actually, we're doubled now. <laughs> Since yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lars Nidfa, obviously the director, executive director of M+, which we'll even talk about this name in a few moments. Um, one of the founding directors of the Tate Modern, and then coming to Hong Kong via a stretch at the Moderna Museum in, in Stockholm. Of course, a, a great place for contemporary art. Uh, Tobias Berger, with um, a bit of local expertise, having served for several years, 02 to 06, should we say, as the director of Parasite, 07-ish. Um, Hong Kong's leading alternative, nonprofit, independent artist run space, and then uh, via a detour to the Namjoon Pike Art Center, just uh, located outside of Seoul and Korea. Um, and the reason we sort of convened this panel is not because there's a, a manifesto to read or, or even much in the way of specific information to declare, but because there's a lot of interest and a lot of curiosity and not a lot of knowledge about what's actually what you guys are cooking up, mm -hmm. um, shall we say. Uh, if, we, if we read the Times last <coughs> week, we saw a big report kind of um, written in the wake of a, of a boat tour that, um, that Lars led during Art Hong Kong, which was, of course is a fair that now stands in very special relation to Art Basel. Um, with a number of art professionals and journalists and, and a, a big story that came out of this just laid out some of the basic facts. This site, 100 hectares, 40 hectares, well, 100 yeah, acres, acres, sorry, yeah. sort of American measurements, um, and 21.6 billion Hong Kong dollars that were approved in 2008 and are sitting somewhere in a bank account ready to, to fund this colossus. Um, so, and that's about what we know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what else should we know? Uh, we'd know a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, uh, I think I think that well, the M Plus Museum is a part of a larger project that that the Hong Kong government Hong Kong government is behind this. It's their project. It's Hong Kong government land, and they put up the money up front for the project. And besides the big museum that we're building. And I think that's important for the context. There will also be a number of, quite large number over time, of performing art venues, which basically will be home for existing uh, dance theaters or uh, symphony orchestras or theaters and so uh, that already exist in Hong Kong but that are lacking good infrastructure. But M Plus is the completely new creature where everything is built from scratch. It's a museum, it's, uh, we'll, we will build a collection, we will build a building in due time, and so forth. And I think, I mean, if I just should describe very simply what, in a sense, what Hong Kong government came to me with and said that this is what we want, this is how we're thinking about this. These are the three main aspects of this project. They, would, they said that uh, basically what they communicated was that this is very ambitious. This is a big project in terms of size. I mean, we're talking about a building of, in the first phase of Museum of Modern Art New York size, 45,000 square meters, basically, uh, or the ability to build that as well. And it's also, there's funding already for a second phase when needed, because we know that museums are growing. But it's also an expectation that this museum could, using all the qualities that Hong Kong can provide, that it should be uh, maybe a role model for future museums in Asia also, to set certain standards museologically and so forth. So that's one thing. Second is that it's public service. This is for the people of Hong Kong. It's not a prestige project. It's not just a project for to bring tourists to Hong Kong. It's really to give a platform for visual culture, visual art in Hong Kong. And then thirdly, they said, and this is quite unusual, that is combined with, with uh, uh, you know, big resources and high ambitions, and that is that we should 
try to rethink what a museum is in the 21st century and, and challenge the given models and try to find a new model while without losing the qualities of what's won in the great museums in the West, basically. So um, to go back to sort of first principles, that, is that where this name M plus comes from? Could you tell us a little bit about that? No, no, um, originally, on that side, um, there were actually four museums planned. And then this project um, didn't work out for various reasons. And they had a new think tank. And then they thought, um, instead of having an individual museum for um, visual art and one for film and one for design and one for popular culture, it would be much more timely to have one big museum. And that's where this museum plus, M plus idea came out. And actually, if you're in Hong Kong, it's exactly what you find with people. Most of the artists there. Um, or, or also have another hat. They're either designers or a lot of architects make art. And so things are not, um, not like in Europe or in America where you only have one profession. A lot of creative people in Hong Kong have actually two or three professions and they are very, very respected in all these professions and quite good in it. So it is actually um, very much Hong Kong and what, was, what Lars said that it is a Hong Kong museum to have one big museum and it's also very much more for the 21st century. Um, and, and it will be completed sometime during the 21st century. <laughs> yeah, we think so. No, I mean, I, I, we, 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 we met, by, I mean, there will be an architectural competition first the next spring, but we met with some architects and we just discussed, uh, you know, the project and talked a little about the project and we said that, and we aim at opening in the latest in 2017. And they said, oh, that's very soon, they said. So six <laughs> years is very soon giving a project like this. But that's our, uh, our perspective right now, that from, from today in six years, it should definitely be in, in place. But, um, and, uh, but I mean, we also believe that the museum is not the same as the building. It's actually a relationship between the content and its audiences. And in a sense, that means that we can start the museum now, if you like, or as soon as we have enough hands on deck. So we will actually start slowly becoming M plus way before that, already next year, we hope, sure. and start doing projects, building a small pavilion, start a nomadic museum in Hong Kong, in a sense. I'd love to come back to that in a minute, but first I kind of want to skip ahead and ask sort of, so it's 2000, let's say it's the 2018, 2019 program year. What, what does that year look like? I mean, what, what kind of mix of exhibitions? I think it's, I mean, first of all, we, we try not to have individual departments. As I said, people in Hong Kong have, are quite holistic. Um, so it will not be like in other museums where you have one photography department and one design department and one, um, say, art department. It will be more exhibitions that include everything. And for example, a nice um, exhibition I could always Im imagine is a Wong Kar Wai exhibition, which is this great um, Hong Kong filmmaker. And there you would have an exhibition where you can very nicely show very important films, not only Wong Kar Wai films, but you can also show important um, Asian design and popular culture. So that is an, a kind of exhibition which I think we can imagine very well in the museum. But certainly we have other briefs, like we have ink art in our brief, which are much more complicated. So there, there are going to be small pockets where we also go very, very deep into certain, certain genres. But when you, when you come to the museum and say, you, you proposed 18, 19, so the museum has settled a little bit, it's the first sort of mm -hmm. mega wave of, of visitors has, has passed through, I think that you, you, you likely will come and you, there will probably be like two or three exhibitions running parallel. Uh, one, I'm sure, will have a strong sort of Asian or Chinese or Hong Kong focus. Another will bring amazing things from other parts of the world to Hong Kong, because as you know, I mean, one of the big lacks in the Hong Kong sort of cultural ecology is the lack of major exhibitions of great art from the rest of the world. You can go any, any day in, in the week and listen to a great concert where there's, uh, there's a fabulous performer, but actually you have to go back several years before you find ama an amazing exhibition with art from somewhere, world-class art from somewhere else in the world. Besides and this is a lacking. Movies. Sorry? Besides the auction previews. Besides yeah. the auctions and the, and the art fair, I suppose. Yeah. But these are non, not curated exhibition of one artist or, you know, the auction previews and the, and the art Hong Kong, which is fantastic. But they, 
that kind of art that is in the market is certainly a very different art than you want to show in a museum. And especially in Asia, these, ma these ideas of the market um, develop totally differently than, than in, um, in the West. So that's also something which this museum has to do. It has to renegotiate and refine the idea of, a of, of Hong Kong and East Asian art. But I think also, of course, the connection or collections, if you like, would be, of course, at the core of the museum because that's, I mean, any museum, I mean, it's really the identity. That's the sort of the, the soul of the museum. And, and of course, uh, I could imagine that one of the questions, future questions, would be, so how do you think you'll well, devise was, the collection? That was actually what, my next question. What perspective would that have? <laughs> and and, and be, so I'm, I'm sorry to take your role, but, no, uh, no, but I, because it is, so shall I answer it? Well, or? I, I mean, I, let me just sort of inflect it for a second. Yeah. I mean, uh, and this is actually interesting because this morning's conversation in the sort of uh, our puzzle conversation series was exactly about that. It was about how will museums collect into the 21st century, and we had interesting perspectives from Chris Durkin and Nancy Spector mm. and Martin Roth. Um, all sort of Euro-American perspectives, of course, but, um, but one of the big issues that came up was sort of how do you build in micro-narratives you know, about other places in the world. Here, that's not even the question. The question is how do you construct another master narrative, mm -hmm. I think, that's kind of fitting a different time and different moment, but how do you do that through the acquisition of objects, right? Yeah, and, and I mean, whether it is objects or not, I mean, there will be objects for sure, but it will be other things than objects as well, I'm, I'm sure. And I'm sure there, there will be an archive aspect and there will be other ways of, because we also be, we'll be, we'll be working with other aspects of visual culture then that might, may not be so object-based. But if you think about it more from an art perspective to make it a little bit easier and, and more relevant to the art fair, I think that I think what we're trying to, uh, what we'll try to achieve is, first of all, the kind of experience you have when you go to, say, Centre Pompidou, and you walk around in the collection, which we did a couple of days ago before coming here, and you see that, I mean, there's no doubt you're in Paris, no doubt you're in France, no doubt you're in Europe, and there's no doubt that you're in the world, and you see the, the rest of the world out of that perspective. I would like to see, say that, if you, in eight years' time or so, come to this museum, you would see the world from a Hong Kong, China, Asia perspective. And you can think about the collection as a spiral, basically, with having Hong Kong at its core, and then China, Southeast Asia, Asia, and the West and the rest, or the rest and the West, if you like. And, of course, you have very different strategies for how you collect Hong Kong art and how you collect let's say, something that you find absolutely urgent to have in relationship to the core of your collection from, say, Brazil or, or where it might be. Yeah. So it's a very different selection processes. But then in building the collection, of course, we'll try to use every trick there is in the book. Um, well, and then, I mean, collections kind of then become inseparable in a way from the question of governance, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and essentially how the museum will run and propagate itself into the future. And what it, it, it seems to me like we're not talking about a sort of MoMA Board of Trustees model here, yeah. but uh, we hope we're also not talking <coughs> about a panel of Hong Kong appointed civil servants <laughs> model. No, but, but we first have to see where we are. We are in Hong Kong, which means we are not, we are not in China, right? We are in Hong Kong, which is a very special in-between thing, um, which has freedom of ex absolute freedom of expression and a really good governance system, right? So there's not, um, but there is certainly, um, the fear that government would, inter would interfere too much in the museums, as it has in the other museums, who are underneath the, um, the Home Affairs Bureau. So, um, so that's but that's actually, I think, to our good, because we have this mandate to do something different. And we are, at the moment, kind of um, working on a governance that keeps us as independent as possible um, from that government. But since the government gives us so much money, um, certainly there has to be some kind of public control. Sure. I mean, no. No, I mean the, like, the likely model we will land in, and then this is actually that is literally in process right now. Papers are being written and this is something that will be defined during the, the fall, coming fall, is that we, we will land in a, in, in a governance model, I think, that is quite similar to, say, Tate. I would say, or, or uh, I mean, a, a national museum in the UK or in Europe, I would say, is, is the most similar. There are more or less complex versions of that. So where you have 
you have arm's length distance from government, you have an independent board, but where either parts or the whole board is, is, is selected on suggestions from, from management, but selected ultimately by government. Mm -hmm. And it will be a version of that, and exactly where we land, we don't know. But the intention from, from Hong Kong government side is to create a new model, which is more hands-off, more arm's length distance, and, and with a greater degree of freedom. And exactly what it's going to be, we'll yet to see. But the fantastic thing is certainly that we are involved in doing that. So it's not like it's all set up and then you come in and you have to work with it, that we can actually actively, through certain steps, help to make that happen. And that's like with the building and with the collection and so on. The great thing is that actually there are curators and a director or and chief curators in place to shape the governance and the collection and the, and the architecture of that, of that great project. Will you be looking to, I mean, we know that the art market is quite hot in China, uh, that there are all these Chinese collectors kind of emerging. Uh, will you be looking to include donations from people like this? And is that, will that be part of the collection strategy or from you know, people like the Olins or the Sigs you know, who have <laughs> built these great collections of Chinese contemporary art outside of China? I mean, if you look in that book where all the tricks are, of course, one, one <laughs> great, one great uh, and fantastic way forward is, of course, to, to build trustful relationships with uh, collectors who have collections and they are looking for a long-term home for their collections. Just like once upon a time, Giuseppe Panza did, for example, with, with Mocha and later with the Guggenheim and so on. You can, so of course, the, if, if that is possible and you can develop these relationships, uh, and the earlier you do that, of course, the better. Uh, of course, that's one way and one possibility that we definitely are looking into, and we are in, in discussions of that kind. Uh, and then we'll see how much trust we can build without having anything than, than a, a, a aerial photo of a construction <laughs> site, which actually the construction that's going on is not even us. It's, it's actually the express train to China, mainland <laughs> China, that's being built there right now, yeah. which will land under the site, basically. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you can show where you want yeah, to build can, the museum. We can say where mm -hmm. the actual museum site. So what you're looking mm -hmm. at here, just to shift a little bit. Wait, uh, yeah, you can point. Do you want me to point? And, okay. and describe. So, so this is the ICC, which at the moment is the highest building in, in Hong Kong. And on top of that is the highest hotel in the world, which is quite attractive. Um, our <laughs> offices at the moment is here on the 27th floor. So that's quite nice. We can, we can look over the site. And the site actually is that, basically that, that big piece of land. Here, here there will be the big, um, the big train station Lars was talking about that will connect directly to Guangzhou and then to Beijing. And um, the 15 performing arts when and Forster, um, Norman Forster just um, won the competition for the master plan. The master plan does not mean that he will build the building. The, the master plan only means he can basically build the, in, not, propose the infrastructure and um, yeah, have his ideas about the infrastructures. And Norman Forster um, proposed a huge park, which will go basically all the way down here. And then we will have a long line of cultural, cultural venues, like 15 theaters and the big, um, and the big M plus um, around here. And at the moment, we think and hope that in that area here, we can have actually M plus. And this this area is great because it actually gives us um, not only gives us a really good big footprint, which is important because, as Lars said, we do need space to grow. If we go, if we are going to be here, like it was proposed by Forster and other, we cannot grow in like 10, 15, 20 years. But here, because there's nothing around it, we can actually have a, a big footprint, and we have a great view from here up to Hong Kong Island. is on the other side, so you have a great view you'll be up right in front of this big building. And um, yeah, and so we kind of decided that this would be the best place um, to have the museum at the moment. And, so, and our little pavilion last was just talking about will, I think, be somewhere here in two years. So if you come into Hong Kong in two years, you first have to look here so before you can go here. So that's, a, that's an interesting question, because of course you've come from a, uh, 
a sort of guerrilla exhibition <laughs> background. Um, <laughs> what Sorry. sorts of uh, what sorts of guerrilla projects do you have uh, in the works exactly? So a pavilion on the site, which will still be a construction site. Yeah, I mean the pavilion on site will be actually two. Uh, actually, will be three pavilions on site, which will be adjunct. One will be us, which uh, with about 300 square meter exhibition space where we will have um, some smaller monographic art um, exhibitions of important Hong Kong artists, as, as well as kind of very curated group shows. But right beside it, the performing art section also will build the same pavilion. So we also have a performing art venue we can use for film screenings and talks and so on, which we think is very important. And these two will be connected by one pavilion, um, which will ha have a bookshop, because there's actually no good art bookshop in Hong Kong, and a cafeteria, and also an information center um, about the West Kowloon project. So it will be already, I mean, it will be a great space to experience, but it's also kind of a practice for us to build and to how do we work together and how do we play it. So it's kind of a little model of the bigger bigger thing later. But I think that the guerrilla, the guerrilla part is, I mean, this is really the base camp for a nomadic activity. And, and I think two thirds or even more of our activities would happen elsewhere. I think out in, this is the place to find us. Mm -hmm. But then there will be project going on in whatever site, uh, whenever place an artist wants to do a project in. If someone wants to do something on a boat that cruises in the harbor, we'll find that boat and we do that cruising. Yeah. And, and if someone wants to do, it, do something in a treetop, we try to find a treetop, and which can be hard in Hong Kong. And then, and then we do something there. So, uh, so this is like the laboratory period in a way. Yeah, that will yeah. Last kind of yeah. Not only for exhibition, but also for, t um, for t training staff, for also living together with performing art people, uh, performing art venues, and, and also about building. At the moment, we are building this pavilion, and there are all these questions already coming up that will also come up at the big buildings later. But it's much easier to do that on a small two, three million dollar project than later on a two, three hundred dollar million dollar project. And it's of course also about building audiences and, and indicating what we're about, defining the different strands of content that we will be working with in the future for, for the Hong Kong audience in a sense. Yeah, because there is certainly kind of a doubt that we get the numbers of audience we are hoping for. Because people in Hong Kong like science better than art. That, that's a, that's a, that was a government survey a few years ago. That was like a statistic that was put out there. Sorry. I think, no, but, I mean, but really, this actually gets to a much bigger question about in a system which is sort of appended to another system, but sort of this independent zone within it, what does it mean to be a citizen, essentially? Mm -hmm. but, but, but that is the idea of that museum, right? It is, it is about Hong Kong identity on the one side, but it's also to build a kind of platform to negotiate many different ideas. And the main, and Asian, Asian, or, yeah, Asian or Eastern art certainly comes from a very different background than Western art, and we do need exactly that platform to negotiate that in the future. And that is also what Hong Kong is, ab about what you are as a citizen. You are in between. You are in, a, in that limbo situation. You're not a city, but you're not a country. You have freedom of speech, but you're not a democracy. You are um, part of China, but you're not China. And you have all these little things that make it really interesting and super challenging to be in Hong Kong, and why this is really the best place to, to do that project at the moment. The <laughs> best place to be, almost. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but uh, I mean, also, the, the Hong Kong citizen is a very particular thing, because the, I mean, the entire Hong Kong is basically built up of people who came there for reasons that they couldn't be somewhere else or didn't want to be somewhere else, and they came there. It's really this kind of uh, magnet for, for people who fled for, because of the revolutions, because of wars, because of, or they did come for financial reasons and opportunity. So it's, it is really this incredible sort of meeting place for, I mean, it's one of the very few metropolises in the world, actually, which is not inward looking. It's not just a big place that is inward looking. It's extremely outward looking, as you know. And this makes, there's an incredible platform to do this. I heard it's Asia's world city. Yeah, they say that's, so. That's it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know which uh, branding agency come up, <laughs> come, came up with that, but I'm sure it's true. Um, well, I th we have just a few minutes left and quite a lot of people <coughs> who I'm sure maybe have certain things that they'd like to hear. Um, if there are questions, are there questions? It's all crisp and clear, isn't it? <laughs>
if there are no questions, then I, I'm going to ask another question because we still have five minutes. Um, one amazing trend in Hong Kong right now, too, is that you actually, I mean, obviously, this is the mother of all sort of cultural infrastructure projects, but you actually have a, a lot of things happening, right? I mean, you have our Basel acquiring majority stake in Art Hong Kong. Um, you have, for example, the Central Police Station project, which will is on a similar but maybe more, slightly more compressed timeline of a sort of yeah. creative cluster in the very center of the Two city. Two and a half years from now, probably. Which will be a, a district of galleries and uh, art institutions kind of amidst um, in the center of the city. Um, you have the married police quarters. Mm -hmm. You have also the Asia Society Center, which will open yeah. behind Pacific mm -hmm. Place in February of 2012. Um, I mean, is there? Is there? Where do you fit in? The, I mean, or kind of like, should <laughs> we should we be optimistic? <laughs> I mean, I'm. I don't know what you mean optimistic about what, but I, I think that, I suppose that under, underneath, it, is there an audience for this? Is there a need for it? Is there a sort of a fertile ground for it? Is that what you're? It's, I mean, it just, it just seems quite interesting that like, there's it, a, a, dis, a certain moment is very distinctly approaching, right? From mm. a, a city that kind of went many, many years kind of bemoaning its own lack of a, of a cultural mm. infrastructure, that it's sort of all arriving at once. I think, I think it's great that there are several things arriving more or less at the same time or with a few years in between them because that, that finally helps to create, well there is, there is an ecology of course, there is a cultural, even in visual arts and visual culture there is an ecology in Hong Kong, but it, it really lacks arenas and, and places to be visible outside the commercial arenas I would say. And, and I think it's really great that there is a number of different things coming now. I think I'm, I'm really, really happy, for example, that Central Police Station will open a couple of years or three years before us, because that, is, that, will, that will be a sort of mid-size uh, place that can, can provide better, better spaces for things like Parasite, which, which uh, Tobias was running earlier on, and, and other, other players. So we, we're not supposed to carry everything and mm -hmm. to do everything. I mean, it also helps us to define our role. And then, I mean, the, there's the big question about, oh, is there an audience for this? And I, I must say, I've never been involved, and I've been involved in a number of big museum projects and so over time. And I've never, ever experienced that people say, oh, this will, we are sure this will be a great success. And, oh, it's such well-spent money. <laughs> And, uh, and of course, you will get more visitors than you think. When we were building Tate Modern, no one thought we would be able to raise the money for starters. And no one thought we would get more than a million and a half, two million visitors annually. And poof, I mean, it sits on five million. I think there's an iPad moment when, when you do something really good, where suddenly people, mm -hmm. people discover that, wow, there's this thing. I had no idea I wanted it, mm -hmm. and that it was really important in my life. But as soon as it's there, you know, it's really important for you. And, and I think that that has happened again and again with, with many great, well-run cultural projects, especially if they actually take the audience or the audiences into consideration from day one. I think the losers are always those mm -hmm. who don't bother about the audience. I'm, I'm actually just gonna ask the very last question because I'm gonna ask the question that people will blame me for not asking, which is, can, could we have an Ai Weiwei retrospective at M plus? Sure, sure. It's a simple answer. <laughs> okay. No, no problem. No problem. Oh. Let me just make sure we we out. Okay. Oh wait, I'm sorry. This this lady had her hand first. I'm sorry. <coughs> sorry for that. Are you here? Oh, okay. Uh, what kind of art will you be collecting for the new museum? Or will it be you who is going to do that? Or other people who will be appointed? Uh, that was sort of two questions. I, I'm trying to do, do the second question first. <coughs> <coughs> we hope that acquisitions will be, I mean, driven and defined primarily by the curatorial team. It will not only be me, but I mean, we're recruiting a team as we speak, more or less. And uh, of course, I hope that we will have a team which has enough diversity and with so many smart people, so there is enough friction in the team, so we're not too streamlined. 
also in our view on what is important and so forth. And that acquisition will be driven by the team, but I think it's also very important when you build something on this scale and, and that you also have an acquisition committee that sort of can uh, provide even further outlooks and also be a buffer for you in terms of responsibility. So I think this is how it's going to happen. I mean, it will be curatorially driven, but with an acquisition committee as well. And in terms of what we're going to collect, I mean, as I try to describe with this spiral, that we will collect art from Hong Kong. We should be the best museum in the world, of course, with, uh, of artists in Hong Kong. We should be a really great museum for Chinese contemporary art. And we should be quite good at Southeast Asian art and Asian art in general. And we should have the most phenomenal key works that make sense in relationship to the core of the collection from the rest of the world. And when I'm saying art, I, sh I think it's important to underline again that we are really attempting to create both a collection and a program that looks at wider visual culture, and, but has an approach to that that is mainly looking at how, uh, let's say, design or cinema or so interacts with the concept of art but also occasionally giving space for the specific, uh, specific stories of, say, Hong Kong design or, uh, or cinema or uh, whatever it could be, separate stories, or the story of ink art, which both can be seen as contemporary art, but also has its 2,000-year-long history of ink painting, in, which is Chinese. So, but uh, it's like a spiral, I would say. And the perspective is Hong Kong, Asia, looking at the world. Relevant answer? Mm. Okay. Um, we one can have one more. Oh. One, yeah. uh, but actually, okay, she didn't re raise her hand. Yeah. I'm sorry, oh, she sorry. was kind of queuing yeah. up. Yeah. Okay, I, I basically have uh, one question, but it's actually in two parts. Uh, because of the proximity of uh, Macau to Hong Kong, so as we all are aware of, the casino is the most vibrant and revenue-bringing uh, <laughs> uh, entity in, actually in the world, I can say that. So um, traditionally, uh, in some countries, uh, an entity such as casino uh, will be a chief patron of the museum. Mm. So since you have uh, that much money already sitting in the bank and is initiated by the Hong Kong government, mm. my question is, uh, is there a role that this casino will be playing in the building of the M plus? So that's question one. The other one is still related to casino. Uh, it is uh, slightly different. Because you are trying to attract a lot of visitors and you are saying that this will be the one first time very good cultural infrastructure for Hong Kong uh, and also that part of the world. Uh, the question is, recently uh, there was an article about the uh, neuros, uh, from neuroscientists about a part of the brain that is dealing with this word called addiction. So addiction is not a bad word. I'm addicted to computer, for example. Some people is addicted to art and, and etc. So is there a way whereby this beautiful infrastructure will convert the people of a certain addiction to a certain <laughs> other type of addiction? Thank you. Thank you. I love that. I love that question. <laughs> of course, uh, to, uh, to, to answer the second question first, uh, we, of course, we hope so. We hope that we will create the, a very, very good sort of art addiction and, and visual culture addiction. As to the Macau question, I mean, Macau and Hong Kong are different entities. And, you know, in Hong Kong, uh, you can basically only gamble on horses. So the big money comes and from soccer. the Hong Kong Jockey Club. And actually, the Hong Kong Jockey Club is, uh, is the main funder of the uh, central police headquarters. I mean, the other Kunsthalle uh, art space that we're talking about. I don't think, we haven't had any signals that the gambling tycoons in Macau has, uh, has asked to support us. What do you know? 
but we'll, we'll, we'll look at their money very carefully, <laughs> I think, before we take them. And <laughs> Stanley Ho has other problems. Yes. I think, I think that's a, a horses and addiction um, <laughs> and art museums. I mean, I think we're kind of come, come to the all. end of our, our half hour. And I, just a, a pleasure to have uh, a chance to really hear from, from the two of you on this new institution and where it's going. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank, thank you. And, uh, thank you for coming, everyone.